Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is R. Lee Ingalls. I'm the author of a new book, Ingalls on the Prairie, which is the story of my parents, uh, Gene and Fern Ingalls, and their early years, the years of uh, childhood, getting married, and then um, bringing in eight children into the world and up through the time that those kids started leaving. Uh, today, uh, we are going to, we are very fortunate to be able to talk to my brother, Kurt. Uh, it's just him and I today, and we're going to talk about a couple of our experiences together, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the video. Kurt, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. My name's Kurt. I'm the number four um, in the family. Um, just in that place that nobody pays any attention to you. Um, not the oldest, not the youngest, but um, so that was fun. I got to do a lot of things that nobody noticed. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will have I to say. have a high respect for my mom and dad. Eight kids, I have two. I can't imagine how they did it. Um, yeah, no, I agree. And with that, um, I'll go back to Rain. Yeah, yeah. So, and I would say, I would have to add one thing. There's no way that anybody was going to not know Kurt was there. You always make sure that we knew. Um, so yeah, we were we we're part of the middle bunch. We were. We weren't the oldest, we weren't the youngest, kind of in the middle. Uh, but so the way that it lines up is Barbara is the oldest, then it was me, then Brad, then Kurt. So Kurt, Brad, and I um, were really close in age, and we did a lot of the things together. Uh, but today, what we're going to talk about, one of our, uh, the biggest events in our lives as kids was the move from uh, North Minneapolis on Sheridan Avenue to the farm. Uh, it was a complete change of life for all of us. And those of us who were old enough to really have good memories of what it was like to live in the city had not to transition to farm kids that we knew absolutely nothing about uh, and, and actually received minimal instruction. We were just kind of pushed out there and did it on our own. So Kurt, what are your thoughts about that the move? What life looked like in Minneapolis and then what did it look like on the farm? Um, life in Minneapolis, I think if we would have stayed there, probably would have ended up bad for me just because um, some of the kids I started hanging around at that young um, 9, 10, 11 years old um, probably weren't going to end up being the best influences. Um, and so I was looking forward to moving out to the farm because I've always had a high interest in, in animals and 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 their way, um, I thought that that was going to be a whole new awesome outlook for us. I've gone out with the, to the farm a couple of times with mom to go to the school and kind of get acclimated there and, and get us all signed up when I found out that it's not going to be so good. When the kids hollering out of the schoolhouse at me, they call me a freak and a hippie. Um, I wore bell-bottom pants. They didn't even know what those were. Um, yeah, so it, like Lee said, it was a complete, um, different course, um, at a young age. So that was three. I think bad. my dad's motivation in moving us was all, all of us older kids were starting to move in a crowd that could go either way. Um, so that was certainly one of the motivations for getting us out of the city. And you are absolutely right. When we moved out there, we were city kids and we were determined that we were going to stay city kids. So we, we totally looked the city part, even though we're living on a farm, uh, which may or may not have worked. It certainly separated us. Uh, also, you know, Margo talked about the fact that, you know, we, half of us look like mom's side of the family. So we have dark hair. And we tan like instantly. We go outside for a few minutes and suddenly we, we have these deep tans. So by the end of summer, we were all pretty brown. Um, so we were the brown kids. Uh, and we had a little bit, I, I certainly felt it, and Margo mentioned that she did as well, uh, that we were, we were not well received uh, for that reason. And you're part of the, part of the Pat Node look as well with the dark skin and dark hair. Yeah, and there was... Um... There wasn't really anybody that would match that. Um, there was probably a few kids up there that tanned fairly fast, not as fast as we did. Um, and the fact that we were on a hobby farm, we spent, did spend a lot of time outside. So 
we uh, tan really fast. Um, yeah, and it ended up being um, like we were in a completely different world. Well, we were. Um, yeah. One thing that we did is we um, adopted really, really quickly because we started getting animals right away. So I think it started out with two calves um, and then the horses started showing up. Yes, and I did end up going to a couple of the auctions with that um, where he ended up buying a couple of horses and and the one I remember the most was uh, his name was Thunder. He was a big chestnut um, and he we bought him from a local farmer there and uh, he ended up being a, a, an immaculate horse. Um, Dad ended up using him in the mounted posse. Yeah. And that was quite the formation. We got to see a lot of variations of animals coming onto the farm. Uh, Thunder, for example, had never been in a trailer, a horse trailer. And by the time we got into the farm, um, he was almost out of that horse trailer. Wow. So, you know, Leon, yeah, I'm sure you remember that. Yeah, now that you mention it, I do. I forgot all about that. They, Mom and Dad had uh, used somebody else's two-horse trailer. And yeah. by the time we got him back to the farm, he had ripped out the entire inside of that trailer where he's, he's looking out the back. Yes, and his head was sticking out the back door. Yeah. Which yeah. Um, was Actually, not supposed to be him. his head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We bought the horse from the Lepowski family. Yes, they had... Um, before they started selling their horses, they had a riding stable there and a couple incidences and they decided to get rid of the riding stable and and we bought one of the horses that ended up being one of their problem um, yeah. horses. We didn't find out until we got them home. Yeah, and Thunder was probably the prettiest horse that we had, just like you said. He was the red color with the red mane and tail and very much a... a a beautiful quarter horse shape, uh, but yeah. you're right. When we put the saddle on him and start tightening the, the cinch, um, he would kind of pass out a little bit and all of a sudden just pop up. Um, and then, then we could finish tightening it, uh, to put it on him. And then we also taught him how to rear up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which was fun. And, and luckily yeah. Randy got a couple <laughs> photos of it because I when I talked about it, nobody really believed it. But yeah, he was pretty good at rearing up. Yeah, um, yeah, he was. In fact, if you go on the website, uh, I do have those photos uploaded already. So they're there. Oh, nice, nice. Um, and so, yeah, Thunder was, like we said, he was a beautiful chestnut quarter horse. Um, and he had he had the attitude. He, he didn't know that he was a gelding. He thought he was still a stallion. Yeah. And so when we went to horse shows and stuff, um, sometimes that became an incident. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, Dad riding him. Um, I don't, I don't think Dad was afraid of him necessarily, but maybe unsure of him. Because you're right, you know, we, you, Brad, and I got to where we could ride the horses really, really easily. We knew the amount of aggression that we had to use to keep them doing what we wanted them to do. But dad didn't know that. Uh, so without that, the horse was probably a little bit more at liberty to do what he wanted to. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and after we found this out, we uh, comforted dad and to know that we would work with him on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. We showed him how to do that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there was the Williams boys across the road. Yes, and the first time that I met them, um, where they built their house was just a field, a hay field. And when they came out there to look at it, they stopped over and I was out um, by the barnyard um, playing with the animals and came over to see what they wanted. And uh, Mr. Williams and then three of his sons um, were there, um, Todd, and uh, boy, what was your name? 
Todd, Troy, and Scott. Okay, good for you. Um, I would never have come up with their names. And yeah, that's probably because I was over there playing baseball with them a lot more. <laughs> yeah, they were more my age and younger. They weren't even my age, they were younger. Yeah. Um, so you probably didn't want too much to do with them at that time. They were too young. Yeah, yeah. Um, the one event I remember was when they got their Shetland pony. And they came over and wanted to raise our Shetland pony. So, and that was Macy is the one that we were going to raise. Not, the other one was Chico, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Chico so was the one that broke the rope and ran on the highway. He was scared of thunderstorms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that too. Yeah, so the Williams boys brought their little pony over and we decided to put Monty on Macy because we were all, you know, we were all too big for that Shetland pony yeah. except Monty. Um, so, and then we got up in the pasture right up by the, um, that little hill that was in the back and they were going to race down the hill. Oh, um, yay. Yeah, and then as they were racing, their little Shetland bucked a little bit and threw the kid off into a thistle bush. And then he jumped up, started screaming, and took off running home without his horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. His mother came over to get the horse, and she was mad at us for doing that to her kid. And I'm thinking, we didn't do it to your kid. So yeah. Tough enough if he wants to run with the big boys. <laughs> yeah. Well, and don't send him over here riding a horse if he can't ride it. You know? That's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I no. hope they don't hear me saying that at this age, but... <laughs> <laughs> um i'm sure they got the dirt the print they quit riding their horse over there so um and i don't even think they kept it very long i think uh they all decided that they didn't really want a horse and got rid of it and i think they ended up getting a little mini bike which, yeah if i recall correctly i don't think they had an outbuilding to keep the horse in uh, so it was difficult for them to keep, and he was out in the uh, small pasture. It was just, it was not a good setting to keep a horse in. No, you're right. You're right. They had no place to keep him in. And uh, um, I don't know if they had talked to mom and dad about maybe keeping him over at our place, but we were new out there. We didn't really know, you know, um, boarding other horses or even boarding our own horses. We were learning about them. Um, so yeah, that that worked out. But Williams ended up being our only neighbor for a long time that moved in after we moved in that area. Yeah. Um, I was so glad that we didn't have people crowding our place. It was just amazing. You could go outside and um, as Margo found out, she could let the chickens out of the barn and uh, yeah, there was um, a lot of fun that we could have, and and we did. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, it was fun. And like I said, for city kids moving out to the farm, we really were not given any instructions. We were just told, you know, you have to do this. So we figured out how to get it done. And uh, we all managed to have a good time uh, at the same time. Yes. And and the amazing part is, like, like you said, Lee, we came out there and we didn't have any idea. We had only visited farms, never really spent much time on them. And so I've always said, you know, um, the parents did the good job if the kids end up making it. <laughs> True. But they end up still being alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so toward, was, or toward the end of my stay, we had at the farm, we'd have a bunch of cows, a bunch of horses, pigs, chickens. Everything you can imagine. Yes. And as far as I was concerned, chickens were the only thing that could not be ridden. The pigs <laughs> I rode, the cows I rode, the horses we rode, we rode all of them. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. So what was school like for you while you were out there? Um, starting school out there, at first, everybody didn't know what to think of us because we were from Minneapolis. So everybody treated me like I was really tough. 
And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you guys don't know me very good. I got two older brothers that would argue with you. And, uh, but they treated me um, really, um, I don't even know how to say it, um, more than just respectful. But once they found out that I was just a regular person like them, then I started getting punches to the back and the arm and, you know, the kid thing to do. Um, I did enjoy it a lot more than going to school in the cities. Um, and, but I did not like school. I got to admit that. I did not like school. Um, yeah, we were kind of all the way, you know, the, the struggle for us was, I think, for, and I'll say it, explain it for myself, but I think that carried out through many of the uh, kids in our family. And that is, um, we think really, really quickly. And if you don't keep our attention, if you don't keep up with the, uh, as fast as we're thinking, you lose our attention. And then, then it's hard to get it back. Uh, and that was kind of my experience. It, you know, I always thought I had trouble focus. Well, I don't really have trouble focusing. I have trouble focusing in a slow paced environment. Uh, it's yeah. got to keep up with the way that I can absorb it. And that, I think that became problematic for us because when you're put in a classroom setting, you really have to teach to the slowest group in the classroom. And a lot of times that lost us. Uh, but yeah. I, you know, I did okay in school, uh, certainly not as well as I could have. And then mom and dad with eight kids, dad working as much as he did, um, they really didn't have time to sit down with us individually uh, to make sure that we were getting what we needed. So I kind of agree with you on the school thing. It wasn't my favorite thing to do. But I think it was for those reasons more than anything else. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I agree with you on that, that um, there's a lot of things that I thought, come on, we already know that. Let's move on. Yeah. And then I was off doing something else in my own mind. Um, and so I missed the rest of the class. And so, yeah, you're right. And then there was a lot of, like you said, um, it was all country. We moved into how many people were in Waconia when we moved there? It was like, I don't know, 1,100, something like that. Yeah, and that was yeah, the whole town. So. And that's in the whole town. Yeah. Um, I think we had more people than that on our block down in Minneapolis. Yeah. 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 It was a completely different environment. And, um, you know, like we said earlier, the community at that time was largely of German descent. Um, and they really didn't want to be an open community. They were, they were perfectly okay just staying small and, and contained within themselves. So yeah. I don't think we were well received. No, not at all. And I remember mom talking years and years later um, that even after they were living out there for more than a decade, they were still the outsiders. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought, wow, you, you've been living here this long and you're still the outsider. We are still the outsiders. Um, wow, that's that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've been back here recently, but I've had occasion to go back a couple of times in the last couple of years. And it has changed dramatically. You know, the, the main streets downtown still kind of look the same. There's some changes down there. Uh, but the outskirts, like the driving out 284 to where we lived, uh, it's almost completely populated now. So yeah. uh, it totally looks different. And it looks more like a, a small city rather than a tiny town. Yeah, it, you know, it looks very nice. Um, a lot of the buildings are new. Um, like you said, there was a lot of expansion there um, after we left. I've gone there a time or two. I didn't even recognize it. Um, I, I didn't even recognize it. It was, it had changed so much. And yeah. you were right. We lived two miles out of town. And there was probably one area that was less than a quarter of a mile that had about six houses in it and was on a hill. And beyond that, there was a couple of farms and that was it um, to our place. And now um, you're almost to the place where we grew up before you get out of the house. And so it changed a lot. It's amazing. Yeah. True, true. 
So, and then once you left home, you went uh, into the Navy then. Yes, yep, I went into the Navy um, and I wasn't sure what to expect there either. Um, luckily, um, it, it turned out that it was a really good thing for me and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I liked being in the Navy a lot, although I don't think I would have ever done it again. Um, but I did enjoy my time there and I learned so much that it was uh, invaluable. Yeah. I'm going there. Yeah. And that's actually we're, where we're, I started my career. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were very proud of you there. And then you came back, you went, um, you buckled down, put your focus into getting your um, uh, electrical license uh, and pursued your career in that. Yes, yep, I spent, um, I started the electrical career in the Navy as a electrician mate. And then when I came out, I tried working in um, the warehouse a little bit and manufacturing, that didn't really work out for me. So I went back to school and I, be, and I went to be electrician for the next 35 years. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did very well in that. And one of the constants throughout your life, though, is you said that you weren't um, the tough guy that people thought you were in high school. But the, actually, the truth is, you know, that's you've said it a couple of times that you were, you know, you were the tough brother. And that's true. You were in every sense of the word. Um, so anybody who thought otherwise, you quickly cleared that up for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and still, still remain that way today. Yeah, well, I, I try not to be, I try to, um, these days, to try to um, think of other people's feelings, too, not just my own. Um, and that's in communication and interaction. I know that there was a period of time where I maybe didn't do that um, so much or so well. Well, you certainly have demonstrated that in recent years. One other thing that I thought we would talk about, and um, I know it's going to hit you by surprise, but I'll talk about it a little bit to get it back into your mind. And that is the uh, event when in Anoka, when you uh, drowned and, and we nearly lost you. Um, I wrote about that in my book. Uh, and I, I, you know, I told the, the story exactly the same way as I did the day after it happened. So it's never, it's one of those things from my perspective that stays with you with a great deal of clarity for your entire life. So, um, you know, I, I knew it happened. I was intimately involved with the entire thing. Um, but I mean, you came through that with, with flying colors and what do, you, what do you remember of that day and then the times afterward? Yeah, that's, uh very good question. I'm glad you asked it because I really don't remember much of that day other than I was glad that we were all getting to play together. Um, peg or um, whatever it was we were playing. Um, I don't remember that too well. And then I remember um, that it felt like I could not get back to the, I could not get back to shore. It felt like I was, it felt like I was being pulled under. I know that I wasn't, but that's what it felt like. Yeah. And uh, I guess seven years old. And then the one thing I do know, um, after talking to everybody, that I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you, Lee. Um, you showed um, a lot of diligence in your um, in staying with it. I mean, you had some misdirecting of go check here, go look there, and, and you stayed on top of it. And you got me somebody out there to help to help bring me out. And so for that, um, you have no idea how many times I've thanked you for that um, since then. Yeah, well, from my perspective, I mean, I was glad to do it. And there's another piece of that I will talk about in a minute, but what do you, what do you remember after then um, after, do you remember being in the hospital and what was that like and your time after that? Yeah, and there is some, um, 
some things that I kind of remember that um, I don't really talk about much because it's so controversial and I was seven years old. So I'm not sure um, where everything lays on that, but that day, um, I don't know how close it was to that day, but I did have interaction with something or someone that I, I'm not gonna go any further on that. The next thing I know, I woke up in the hospital and uh, and there was a few people standing there and I had no idea where I was or who they were um, until later. And then it all started coming back to me um, through other people telling me because I did not remember. Um, I didn't remember that much that I talked about. Mm. Um, and even you, Lee, I don't, I don't think I sat down and totally um, communicated with you on how that all turned out for me. But one of these days, we'll have to sit down and I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a couple of things that have taken place since that time and some even most recently, you know, the, the lifeguard that actually I went to and got and he's the one that pulled you out of the water and, and uh, provided the, um, the resuscitation during the time he got you out of the water and the ambulance showed up. Um, he sadly, five years after that, uh, was killed in Vietnam, uh, serving in the, uh, the armed services there. Um, so it, I looked for him forever. Um, so I would, anything that, that I could look up to, to find him or his family, something about them, uh, I would look for and I never could find them. Uh, and then suddenly, once I started writing the book, uh, and I'm, I looked as recently as three years ago, um, or three or four years ago, and still didn't find anything even on the internet. Um, and suddenly, I decided while I was writing the book, let me try to reach out to the family again. So I typed, and at this point, I have the newspaper clipping it with me, so I had his full name. When I typed it in, um, it actually pointed me to his father, um, where he was listed as uh, his son that had preceded him in death. And then it took me to another site where um, they had listed all the Vietnam veterans that had passed away, and he, he was in there. Uh, and the picture wasn't exactly the same, but it was close enough I could tell it was the same person. And somebody who identified themselves as his sister made a comment on it. Uh, so I, uh, and her email was there. So I thought, oh my goodness, I cannot believe this is happening. And so I emailed her, she did come back and she confirmed that yes, she was his sister. She does remember that event somewhat because she was, I think she said eight years old at the time and I would have been nine. Um, so, and you know, I went and I responded to her one more time and I said, you know, we, we've looked for your family for decades. I'm so glad that we reached out to, we wanna make sure that you understand how thankful we are that he was there and able to um, you know, save my brother from dying as a result of this uh, drowning. Um, and I, I never really got anything back from her. So, you know, I'm, one, I I'm regret that. I'm, I'm sorry that, that she didn't really want to make that connection. Um, but two, I know that I reached out to the family. I let them know how our family felt. And I think I uh, immortalized him in the book. So if nothing else, he will live on in our book forever. I did a nice... nice. Telling him well, what a nice way to recognize him. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and that was that was one thing. And then, you know, Aunt Marge, um, her family was kind of upset with me about the way that I wrote that story, uh, feeling like I made her out to be the bad person. And, you know, when you write a book, and this is probably going way past our, our topics, but when you write a book, you have to decide if and how often you are going to pull your reader out of the storyline to tell them something that happened decades later. Uh, and I, try, I decided not to do that any more than what was absolutely necessary. Uh, so in the telling of this story, I left the sentiment the way it was during the time period that, that book was written. So in, in an incident like that, it's instinctive for people to place blame on someone. And unfortunately, she was the only adult there. So it was easy to place blame there. But in 
you know, decades later, when I actually did some looking at it, I dissected that event in its individual parts and then did, looked at what could have been different during that, that exact moment that would have changed the outcome. And the only thing that I came up with as far as Aunt Marge is, when I went to her, if she would have jumped up and ran to the lifeguard with me, it would not have changed the outcome. Yes, it would have, Randy. I would not have been underwater that long. No, by the time I got to lifeguard, you were already gone. And if she was running with me, she probably would have slowed me down. So. <laughs> uh, but then I thought she had misdirected you to go check other things and do other things before you no, bothered the lifeguard. No, she didn't. She was reading a book and she glanced up and in all honesty, I don't even know that she saw you. I can't confirm that she saw you. I know she glanced up and what she said was, he'll swim out of it. But I don't know that she saw that you were face down struggling. I don't know that for sure. Yeah, I, I don't know it for sure either. But I, I you know, after, because I went through it around and round and round in my head because, um, again, I'm not going to go too deep into this until you and I get to talk. But um, with it going around and around in my head, I, I, I don't think as an adult, I would just say, ah, oh, yeah, just don't worry about it. They'll, they'll make it to shore without looking and seeing that that's what would happen when it's a seven year old kid we're talking about. Yeah. Um, that's me personally. I don't know. Um, I do know that years later, I had made a comment, um, not to Aunt Marge, but in a room where she was, and she made no comment back which I felt, um, I felt really bad about. And it could just be that, you know, we had eight kids and I'm sure out of us eight kids, there was probably one or two of us that um, not all of our relatives felt really close to. And yeah, I don't, I don't know how that, um, but we can talk about it uh, another time offline. But yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of how I, where I got to it and why it wasn't part of the book. Yeah. And to be honest with you, um, I felt that that was the first time that anybody ever said that, um, <clears throat> that um, I didn't just fail at making it to shore, that other incidences were present that probably helped me not getting there. Um, even though it would have been through somebody else's help. Um, yes, that all knows is I did not know how to swim. <laughs> none of us did. At that point, yeah. none of us knew how to swim. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a day I would definitely, if there was anything that I could do to change it and start it over again, I absolutely would, as I, I think everybody would do the same. But Yeah, yeah, I, me too. Um, I was saying that um, not only would I probably not have played, but I wouldn't have been that worried about getting caught. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> True. True. Well, this was a good conversation, Kurt. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, <clears throat> there is, a, you know, just one other one um, I wanted to point out where you and I had an incident, I don't know if you remember even, down in the tin shed when we were feeding all the horses, we had a, a feeder. Uh, we had, each horse had their own location of where they had to go to eat. Yeah. The ones that we didn't have that with were the colts. And uh, one of the colts got behind uh, my horse, Pecos Bueno, um, and I seen his ears go back and I knew he was going to either bite something to that colt that came up behind him. So I jumped off the fence and landed behind him and said, no, Pecos, just then he kicked and got me right in the stomach. Oh. And, and you said, well, Curly, are you okay? And I said, no, I just got kicked in the stomach. What do you think? No, I'm not okay. <laughs> but I was okay. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know if you remembered that or not, but yeah, you know. no, we used to get beat up regularly by the animals and and each other. 
Yeah. Man in the barn with no sound. <laughs> yep. And I'm yeah. glad now that we're old enough that the ones that used to always beat me up, um, I can mouth off to now because we're adults and they don't just start all beating me up again. <laughs> I, I start out as the big one and I'm the little one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty funny because the youngest one ended up being the biggest one. I know, I know. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, we kind of stair step in the opposite direction. Yes. Here's the next, the next, the next. Yep. Sorry about that. I uh, tend to do that. That's Get all right. Track and, yeah. Um, yeah. How about you, Lee? Um, I haven't really heard a lot of what you. Uh, I know that you and I did really good in the horse shows. Um, working with the horses and stuff, and then we ended up started bringing them in and showing them that horse shows um there was the barrel and you know we did all western style um we stay away from the english yeah um yeah, we quickly um quickly determined that we were not not made for english showing uh and figured out the western style really really quickly as i said um and then we would set up the bar or the farmyard uh, yeah. to to do all the different events. We had the measurements correct and all that kind of stuff. And you and I pretty much worked on training the horses, but when it came to showing them, you were much better in the arena than I was. If I tried to show the horse, I did poorly. If you showed them, they they typically ribbon. Um, well, yeah, kind of that's true, kind of not. You know, there was a few of them that it took two. And uh, you know, like monkey in the tree or, um, some of those where um, they were tough and uh, hanging off that rope like that and trying to get on the back of that horse um, could not have been easy because the horse just wanted to run and yeah. we were trying to get you on the back of it. Well, Monty's um, the one that did that one most often, more often than, I don't remember doing that one, but you and I did the one where we had two horses with the ribbon between us. And we'd have to run out around the barrel and come back. Uh, and it was a timed event. And then the other one was I was standing out in the middle of the field and you would run around me and I'd hop on the back of the horse. and, and then, Yes, and grab I'd the horn that. and actually get up on the back of the horse and ride out. Yep. Yep. And I, I forget what that one was called. I think the rescue, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I'm not and sure. yes, you were good at that one. Um, by far the best. Thank you. Um, that, was, that was fun. Yeah, yep. And we have a lot of fun doing it and ribbons and some trophies for it. Um, it was fun. Yeah, we had that whole wall of ribbons. Yeah. Um, yeah, the one photo that I get a lot of comments on, it's actually you and I in the photo, and it had to have been the one where we were running with the ribbon between us because we are both on a horse. And so it's a, it's kind of an iconic photo. It's really a good one of both of us, but it's a little, you know, in those days the photos were blurry and this one is too, but it's a great photo. I get a lot of comments on it. Awesome. I got to get on there and see those. I haven't seen some of those photos for, um, well, some of them since they were taken. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I look at them and it's like, wow. Um, and it's good that um, you're right. They're kind of blurry and they're kind of, but they could have been way worse for the cameras that we had to work with back then. Yeah. And true. so it's good that you were as good at it as you were. Um, or those photos would have been a lot worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that our family did was take a bunch of photos. Yeah. Yep. And I don't know when I dropped off that. I think when I quit um, working on my motorcycles, I kind of quit taking so many photos. And um, well, I'm not um, I'm feeling real good right now, Lee. And so I was wondering, could we uh, maybe call this a short one? And yep, we sure can. We can pick it up next time.